Do you fly through an active military operations area? Is it legal? Is it safe? Let's find out in the hangar. Welcome to In the Hangar, I'm Christy Wong. Today's episode is brought to you by Gold Seal and iFly GPS. We love our acronyms, so we're gonna talk about MOAs today, or Military Operations Areas with Seth Lake. Seth, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. All right, well, let's just jump into it. First, uh, tell me about yourself. You've got a pretty extensive background. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I grew up in Arkansas, learned to fly there, and um, after high school, went to ROTC at the University of Arkansas, went into the Air Force, spent about uh, 12 years active duty flying the C-130 out of uh, Little Rock Air Force Base for the wow. most part. okay. And uh, a couple years ago, I, I left active duty, went into the Air Force Reserves, and started a small flight school in Central Arkansas, and I'm also a DPE as well now. A DPE, okay, yeah. excellent. So if anybody's looking for a check ride in the Little Rock area, uh, yeah. call up Seth. Okay, well, Military Operations Area, or MOAs, let's talk about that. What is a MOA? Yeah, well, there's actually a, a couple different types of military airspace, quite a few, and they all have in common that we're sharing that airspace with the general aviation or the general flying public. So Military Operating Area is just a location for us to do some sort of training. Uh, nothing standardized about it. Sometimes it's air-to-air uh, training for fighter aircraft. Sometimes it's uh, testing aircraft. We'll do maintenance tests and activity or and activities in MOAs sometimes as well. Uh, so it really just depends. Uh, the other type of airspace that the C-130 really uses and uh, other other fighter aircraft as well is the military training route or the MTR. Okay. So they're the MOA, which are pretty noticeable on the charts. They've got the hashed magenta lines and uh, uh, hopefully everybody covers that in their training on uh, you can legally go through those VFR, but you could interrupt some military activity going on there. Uh, and then the MTRs are the thin gray lines that you see on the sectional charts. Okay. You talked about doing some training air to air and whatnot. You can tell me, I'm not going to tell anybody else. Do you guys purposefully ever intercept civilian VFR aircraft just for the funsies? Uh, well, I'm just a lowly <laughs> cargo pilot, so I don't. <laughs> Have you heard stories of guys that will? I mean, I wouldn't mind if uh, an F-16 rolled up on the Wong Warrior one day. Yeah, I have heard training. And in fact, I think the Civil Air Patrol uh, does operations out in the Western MOAs uh, in Arizona, New Mexico, where fighter aircraft actually practice intercepting those Cessnas. So oh they do my. need the practice. And you got to think about uh, a MOA in, uh, you know, these operations that we do, we might brief for... 12, 13 hours, you know, the day prior uh, and plan and get ready for this big operation. We go out into the MOA the next day uh, and, and fighter aircraft, you're kind of fuel limited as well. So you take off, you get into the MOA to do this mission that you've planned for maybe days. And then a 172 decides to drive right through the center of the MOA and you've just lost uh, hours and hours of training. And it, it could cost the ta taxpayers some extra money for the, the fuel stop or uh, having to cancel the training. So, yeah, you definitely want to take MOA seriously. Gotcha. So we talked about, uh, is it legal? And the answer is, well, yeah, it's legal as long as it's just a standard MOA, right? But is it safe? And your answer to that is? It depends. Okay. Uh, Thank you for clearing as, that up. As long as you're talking to a controller, uh, sometimes the controller will have situational awareness on where the air aircraft are operating in the MOA, and you'll be able to go through it safely. But if, if the controller doesn't have direct contact with the aircraft that are in the MOA and you're flying through, that could definitely uh, be unsafe, um, especially since a lot of the military aircraft don't have uh, as advanced avionics as you would think, especially like my uh, lowly C-130. Uh, we do have a TCAS system. Uh, but we're doing a lot of other things in the aircraft, and we're not necessarily just looking at that TCAS advisory. Uh, and if you, you happen to not have uh, a transponder, I, I fly some aircraft that don't have electrical systems. So mm. uh, if you're flying an aircraft like that, there's absolutely no way we'll know that you're there. Okay. Uh, I know. Uh, I was actually flying a Warrior over Kansas once, 
um, talking to a controller, you know, VFR flight following, because I'm a good, safe pilot. And uh, I was given permission to fly through a MOA, and then I was asked to exit the MOA because it went active. As a pilot, could I tell the controller at that point, unable, I'd like to just keep going direct? Yeah, you probably could, and that would probably start a conversation with whoever activated the MOA. They're probably in contact with the crew that was going in. Uh, one of the things, and, and I work with the Arkansas uh, FAA safety team. I'm a fast team lead representative, and I do kind of uh, liaison activity between military operations and civilian operations. Uh, one of the things I worked on in Arkansas was that uh, all of our C-130s were entering these low-level training routes, which are 500 feet. We can talk about those if you want. Uh, they're around 500 feet AGL above the ground, and they go up to about 1,500 feet uh, AGL. So it's kind of right in that sweet spot where a lot of, you know, um, 172s, 150s, training aircraft, warriors are flying around doing ground reference maneuvers or cross-country mm -hmm. activity. And uh, the problem we were running into is we had a couple close calls because we're talking on a UHF radio, whereas all the civilian traffic are talking on VHF radio. And so you don't get that situational awareness by hearing other aircraft in your area. Uh, the controller, you're, you're kind of hearing a one-sided conversation between them and the controller. Uh, so we actually tried to normalize where now the C-130s are talking more on VHF to to help build everyone's situational awareness about where we're at since we're sharing airspace. Okay, that's actually really good to know. Um, we spoke with AOPA uh, in a previous episode and they talked about the fact that they're lobbying to get MOAs um, more established like TFRs when they go active. So it would be, um, you know, turn them on, turn them off. And pilots like me would be able to look and see, yes, it's it's on and off. Um, what are your thoughts on, on something like that? Do you think it would make it, the situation safer for all involved? Oh, I think it'd be a huge benefit to be able to have that. Um, the, the MOAs, you can look on a sectional and see that they're just everywhere. And a lot of them are around locations that we like to go. Uh, one of the cross country scenarios I like to give as a DPE is flying from Russellville to Destin, Florida. And there's, there's MOAs all around Destin. Um, and so the ability for you to check in your pre-flight and maybe a four-flight briefing or something and see what MOAs are active would be really beneficial. Okay. Now, it, a MOA is not necessarily the same as a restricted or prohibited airspace, correct? Correct. Let's just talk a little bit about that for a minute because I think it's important for our viewers to understand what the differences for those airspaces are. Yeah, so for a MOA, typically we're going to do... Uh, operations that aren't going to involve, um, I guess, firing of any weapons. Yeah, okay. That's, that's what I've, I've heard uh, uh, some of my student pilots uh, talk about is, you know, they're worried about flying through a MOA because they don't want to get shot with a missile. This uh, is a healthy fear uh, to have. <laughs> right. and, and, and as long as that fear keeps you out of the MOA, I guess that's good. But realistically, uh, those operations are done in restricted and prohibited areas. Uh, so any time we're expending munitions, we're going to be in some sort of uh, restricted area. ATC is definitely going to tell you that that restricted area is hot and you're not going to be allowed to go through it. Right, because you cannot go into a restricted airspace without permission. Correct. Okay. Now let's talk about the prohibited airspace. Yeah, so restricted airspace is, that, is, is just what it says. It's restricted. So certain players, we call them, uh, can enter that airspace. Prohibited airspace is going to be prohibited. Nobody is flying into that airspace. Like ever at all? Um, most of the time. Uh, there's there's some prohibited airspace, I think, that uh, can go cold or active. Uh, a great example is here in uh, Texas. There's a couple of tethered balloons that go up to about 15, maybe even higher, 15,000 feet or higher. Uh, that is prohibited airspace. You're not going to fly... Uh, near that tethered balloon, I think it's a one mile radius, because uh, you can come in contact with the balloon tether and that wouldn't be very good. Bad things. Right. Uh, okay. There's also, you know, the the uh, probably most famous prohibited area, uh, that's Groom Lake out uh, in the, the western part of the country. Also uh, known as? <laughs> area 51. There you yeah. go. <laughs> so the, the Area 51 prohibited area, that's obviously a uh, prohibited area, but uh, that's the case where there is aircraft that uh, are able to operate there, uh, but most aircraft are not. 
So tell me, are there actually aliens out there? <laughs> no idea. <laughs> okay, well, fair enough. Uh, okay, what has been your closest call in flying when you were in the military? Uh, well, in the process of doing safety seminars, I go out and I tell civilian pilots about these military training routes because we're, we're out there flying along low level, uh, 500 feet AGL, and uh, enjoying some of the, we call them river tours, but these routes are surveyed from 200 feet to 1,500 feet, like I was saying. So uh, a lot of them are kind of canyon flying. In a big C-130, we have a huge radar cross-section. Uh, our only defense in a uh, kind of a, a high-threat environment would be to fly below uh, mountain tops. So we kind of use that terrain to, uh, to help mask from radar and all that. Anyway, that allows us to fly pretty low, and we're out there practicing, right? And we, we come around uh, this corner, and I see, I think it was a 172. Um, now, the 172, we didn't have a transponder, apparently, because we didn't have them on TCAS. Oh, no. Uh, normally, we can have the, the TCAS a little bit beyond line of sight. So even if there's a mountain in the way, we can see a little TCAS blip on our radar on that other side of the uh, hill, but we didn't see it that time. Uh, and so that is really what got me thinking. We didn't really get close, but had we not been paying attention, I think it could have been bad. Mainly not a, not a mid-air collision, but we had a four ship of C-130s, and that's a lot of wake turbulence. Oh, so wow. if we would have flown in front of this C uh, little Cessna, uh, we could have caused uh, a pretty bad upset um, with our wake turbulence. Would have woken him up. Yeah, definitely. So <laughs> that's where I, I got to... Uh, thinking that that would be a great co topic to talk about with the uh, FAA safety team, do some seminars and remind people that we're out there uh, operating and that those military training routes, uh, well, the ones in Arkansas are the most common. And they're slow routes and they're not even marked on a sectional chart. So there's only a couple of specific ways you can find those. Uh, but just warning people that just because there's not a military training route doesn't mean that there won't be military aircraft operating there. Right. So we, we've got balloons, missiles, and wake turbulence. Are there any other hidden dangers lurking within MOAs? Uh, well, outside of a MOA, uh, this is a fun story that happened. Not fun story, but it has to do with the 210. <laughs> okay. Uh, we had a C-130 at 18,000 feet doing high altitude, low opening training. So they were dropping uh, military you know, parachutists down onto a drop zone. They released their parachutists and forgot to tell uh, ATC, uh, but they were talking on UHF radio anyway, so nobody on the civilian side would have heard. Uh, so they forgot to make the critical call of jumpers away, and ATC forgot to warn this 210 that was flying at 6,000 feet to a local airport that was on an instrument flight plan that there was an aircraft releasing jumpers above them. So this 210 was completely unaware of the C-130 right above them uh, because he was talking on UHF radio. 210 was on VHF radio. Uh, so the, the, the jump master, uh, the lead jump master is free falling. He kind of sees the 210 because we're interviewing him after this. So he sees that there's an aircraft below. Uh, he was able to move, maneuver away far enough and actuate his parachute right at about 6,000 feet. Uh, the 210 pilot was able to see the parachute open and actually had to felt that he needed to maneuver to avoid hitting the parachutist. Uh, that could have been really bad. And that was kind of the breaking point of where we decided, hey, we need to change uh, how we're communicating in the, the airspace that we're sharing with all these general aviation aircraft. And one of the ways we could make it safer is to operate on those VHF radios instead. Yeah, no, that's scary. I felt my heart rate kind of, I was yeah. like, please tell me that they didn't hit. Okay. Well, if you could tell civilian pilots one thing, what would it be? Mm, one thing. I would say uh, if you're unaware of how to identify military airspace or you're uncomfortable with it, get with a flight instructor uh, or reach out to the FAST team. And uh, I, if, if you would like, I can also do webinars for local FAST teams if they have military airspace. Uh, there's also the, the FAST team will have uh, resources uh, like the local military Air Force Base will have a safety center where you'll be able to uh, learn more about the types of operations that are happening in your local MOAs. Seth, that is incredible information. Thank you so much. It, it was certainly a pleasure and I learned a lot. 
All right, you guys, what do you think about flying through MOAs? Leave your comments below. Uh, we'd like to, we actually go through and read all of the comments. So whatever you guys put on there, we'll know. Like, subscribe, and share, and we'll see you next time in the hangar. had a story uh, that one of our loan officers here in Denver had somebody that was just struggling to find all their paperwork. I mean, there, there's a tremendous amount of information that has to be gathered to facilitate the loan process. And, you know, our branch manager here in Denver did a, did a masterful job of guiding that person, that borrower, through the journey. And again, it's the commitment, it's the follow-up to make sure that we have that documentation, we have everything we need that's complete. I think that's one example that comes to mind where somebody was really, you know, struggling a little bit to gather all that information, and we did a wonderful job of facilitating that.